Hello, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome Jomo KS uh, to our COVID-19 and, and international development uh, webinar series being hosted at the Department of Development Studies at SOAS. Uh, Jomo, what can I say? He's one of those people. It's very, very difficult to introduce him in a short space of time because of the long career that he has had and the influence that he has had as an, a producer of knowledge and as someone who has taken uh, positions which are very much sort of out of the box and pushing the frontiers of uh, thinking for not just development economics, but development generally and for economics generally. Uh, that is why in the notice that we put out for today's session, I'd actually added a link to his Wikipedia page where some of you might have seen what a long distinguished career he has had and the number of uh, different institutional positions that he has held over that particular period in which he has influenced thinking and action at the level of the United Nations. Uh, for example, at the UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs, uh, but also uh, on the board of the United Nations Research Institute for Social Development in Geneva. Uh, having taken his degrees uh, from Harvard, he also taught there and in Malaysia at the Science University of Malaysia, uh, as well at uh, the National University of Singapore, at Cornell University and at Cambridge University. Uh, right now he is uh, at the Kazana Research Institute, as well as at Columbia University. And he also teaches at the International Islamic University in, in, in Malaysia. I'm sure that I'm missing out on some of the things that uh, he has recently done, but he is the author of a hundred books, uh, or let me say a hundred plus books, some of them sole authored, others edited, and countless numbers of uh, academic, uh, you know, um, sort of publications in the top journals. Uh, of late, I see that he's also in the last few years, uh, I, I've been reading his material in the IPS news service. Uh, some of you might know that because I actually sometimes forward you those articles to read for uh, as additions to your coursework. And we're going to keep this relatively informal. Uh, we are you know, looking to hear from him about East Asia's experience of COVID containment. Uh, so I'm going to open the floor to him. Uh, he can speak, I think, for about 35 or 40 minutes or as long as he likes. And as in the previous webinars, uh, I'm basically going to take questions via chat at the end of his talk. Where So please you know, carry on uh, writing your questions in the chat and I'll keep a record of that. And once he's done, uh, I, we can just open up uh, with those questions and take further questions as in when you feel like them. Uh, just a slight uh, bit of information. In the background, you might hear the sound of an 11 year old girl. That is my daughter who is uh, currently in, uh, on her online school uh, and basically she is doing her lessons. I hope that she will keep her voice down as I have asked her to do. But without any further ado, can I just welcome once again, Jomo, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Subir. I think you remembered, remembered more about my career than I can. So that's very, very, uh, very kind of you to introduce me so generously. Thank you for this opportunity to speak to uh, colleagues, at, uh, friends, uh, students at SOAS. Um, and uh, uh, thank you also for mentioning the IPS uh, articles. I've been writing them uh, on a weekly basis, but because of COVID-19, I actually had to step them up. Uh, but very importantly, since the beginning of this year, uh, I now no longer have a limit. I was previously limited by something called MailChimp to 2,000 uh, subscribers, and now uh, uh, it's unlimited. And so uh, anybody can, can sign up, and I, I would welcome anybody to sign up. Uh, there are basically two categories for Malaysians, those interested in Malaysia and those not interested in Malaysia. And uh, I presume most people uh, in the class are not terribly interested in Malaysia. So you sign up for the for the what is called uh, uh, develop, I can't even remember the categories, but the development category without the word M Malaysia in it. Anyway, let me come, come back to the topic for today. Um, 
my my last two pieces uh, actually uh, one just came out this today and and another one uh, coming out uh, tomorrow uh, i usually don't write two in a week but uh, i couldn't put them in one article and when i tried to share them uh, as one article i think it caused a lot of confusion so i then uh, resorted to to uh, to breaking it up into two, two different articles but um, they they both deal with the with the critical situation in which we are in right now. But I'd like to come back to that later, if I may, at towards the end. I also hope to have more time for discussion because it's very difficult for me uh, to gauge uh, the level of uh, knowledge and understanding of uh, issues raised by COVID nineteen. I must say that uh, that I have nev never been terribly in interested in infection infectious diseases beyond taking uh, the, the occasional vaccination as necessary. But uh, COVID-19 obviously has been hugely uh, uh, a huge threat and, and has been very, very disruptive and compelled me from a very early, uh, early last year. Um, I, think, I think I got very concerned about it around February, uh, which was about five weeks after the COVID-19 was first identified as a new threat. Now, I think, um, let, let me begin uh, by identifying what differentiates COVID-19 uh, perhaps from some of the other recent uh, epidemics. Uh, younger people might not know, but uh, uh, at least in this part of the world, but also arguably in other parts of the world, we have had a series of, of epidemics uh, of varying scale uh, in the recent period. And it's useful to know that, uh, remind ourselves that um, the, the virus which causes the COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, is actually called SARS-CoV-2. And the reason for calling it SARS-CoV-2 is because uh, it actually um, has many of the same characteristics uh, compared to SARS-1, which was around 2002-2003. Uh, it's important to recognize that SARS-1 uh, was uh, less infectious. Far fewer people were, were infected, uh, but it was more lethal. In other words, uh, much more of the people who were infected actually died. Uh, so SARS, uh, so this uh, COVID-19 is actually less uh, lethal than SARS, uh, uh, the, the original SARS, but uh, also perhaps arguably more lethal than many of the other Pandemic. So I'll just rattle off a few names. Um, I, I think around 15 years ago, there was something called avian flu. Uh, very recently, Kerala, for example, in India uh, in 2018, uh, had a Nipah virus uh, uh, epidemic. Uh, there have also been a number of other epidemics, H1N1, uh, MERS, and so on and so forth. Uh, but I think this, the fact that it's infectious, and particularly the infection is aerosol borne. In other words, it's not airborne. It requires some liquid uh, to, to, to carry it. Uh, but the fact that the droplets can be very small uh, allows it to be carried uh, rather far. Uh, far meaning, uh, you know, uh, up to four, four uh, meters. Now, now th this I think uh, should not be should not be overemphasized because it is very exceptional uh, that you know somebody uh, who who speaks with a mouthful of saliva and speaks very very strongly and 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 the the, the aerosol uh, droplets are borne quite di uh, distantly. Uh, so so the general uh, 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 re recommendation was to stay about two meters away. Uh, during the initial period of, of the of the pandemic, and then more recently, it has been reduced to about one meter. Uh, but I think whether it's two meters or one meter, basically the, the protection offered by masks and shields is something to, to be taken into consideration. I would like to make a little aside about masks, and uh, many people know that the masks which are now most recommended. Uh, for public use yeah, is something called the N95 mask. It's basically a, a three-ply mask. And the reason for mentioning this is that this mask was actually first uh, 
um, introduced at a, on a mass level um, over a century ago. And it was introduced in the context of a plague in, Malay, in uh, Manchuria. Now, the reason I happen to know a little bit about this is because uh, the person who was responsible for introducing the mask there uh, is actually from my old school, uh, where I was born and, and grew up in Malaysia. And he um, was uh, an activist, uh, Cambridge trained, and then um, uh, came back to Malaysia and was very, very concerned because this was the time when the, when the British Empire was getting quite rich uh, with the opium trade. Uh, opium uh, was, was uh, as you know, uh, sort of uh, opened up the China market, uh, so to speak, um, and, and, uh, and uh, uh, the capture of Hong Kong and so on and so forth. The first opium wars, the second opium war and so on and so forth. Now, um, also, of course, as, as you know, in the middle of the 19th century, uh, the East India Company, after the Indian mutiny, uh, closed down and basically um, it was the management of the empire was taken over directly by the crown, or at least in the name of the crown. Now, um, so when uh, Dr. Wu, his name is Wu, uh, 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 campaigned uh, in my hometown against the, the um, opium uh, which was being traded uh, very openly. In fact, it was the single largest source of revenue for the British colonial administration. Um, he was uh, uh, punished and eventually uh, he was uh, basically prohibited from practicing medicine in the British uh, territories in this part of the world. So he could not go to Singapore, he could not go to uh, Hong Kong or, or any place like that. So eventually he uh, ended up working for the, the Manchu em emperor, the last Manchu emperor, went to Manchuria and he, um, he identified the plague as a pneumonic plague rather than a bubonic plague. plague. And uh, a French uh, expert came in and said, no, no, you're wrong ignore the recommendation of wearing a mask and so on and so forth. And eventually, uh, unfortunately, the French expert died within less than a month. Um, and uh, and uh, so everybody then turned to his uh, suggested solution. And that mask is still the basis for the N95 mask, which is still recommended today. Now, having made that little aside, uh, a little bit of hometown pride and all that, uh, let me, let me um, uh, emphasize that, that there, is, uh, there is a larger moral to that story. And that is that uh, just as with the response to the Asian financial crisis, uh, where I think uh, uh, East Asian economies responded very differently. Uh, and before that, of course, the East Asian miracle was done on very different premises, as you know, uh, we have had a history not only dating back over a century, but even in more recent times of ignoring uh, lessons from East Asia. And unfortunately, this has been particularly tragic in the case of the COVID-19. So what we find in, in, in the case of COVID-19 was that when the outbreak first uh, broke out in Wuhan, Wuhan city is the, is the industrial hub of China uh, for, for almost a century now. It's on the Yangtze River, which is one of the major rivers in China. And um, when, it, when the outbreaks began there, uh, there was an attempt, uh, there was a lot of confusion. People, initially there was uh, the belief that this was just a variant of the SARS, I'm oh, sorry, of our flu, uh, of which there had been several uh, epidemics in the past. And uh, it was only at the end of, uh, of December uh, 2019, that it was identified as a distinct um, as a distinct virus, and within two weeks, I want to emphasize this: within two weeks, uh, the genome sequencing for this virus was completed, and most importantly, shared internationally. I'll come back to this issue later because I want I'm going to argue that intellectual property rights and the refusal to share knowledge and information is one of the major impediments, not only to human progress in general, but specifically in this case, 
I would argue that it is actually uh, almost genocidal in the sense that many, many people who would otherwise benefit from the vaccines are not able to access vaccines precisely because of uh, the refusal uh, to, to share this kind of information. For those of you who are very interested in this, uh, there's, a, there's a piece in the Lancet today, uh, which announces the result of the COVID-19, of the, of the trial of the Russian vaccine, the stage three trial. Okay, let's, let's be very clear. The, 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 the Moderna and the Pfizer uh, vaccines are both, uh, have only uh, completed stage two uh, trials. This, the Russian vaccine uh, has, uh, is now stage three. And the finding is that it is uh, more than it's 91 percent efficacious, okay, which is which is uh, better than Pfizer, uh, although not as 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 good as Moderna, at least Moderna and Pfizer as far as stage two is concerned. So, uh, I think it's important, therefore, to recognize that that uh, you know uh, knowledge diffusion and knowledge development is happening all over the world. Uh, including in, in, in the South, in the global South. And we find that, in, that lessons from East Asia were not learned. So in the case of China, I think it's important to recognize that in Wuhan city, by the time the nature of the threat was recognized in the third week of, uh, of January last year, uh, China then imposed uh, uh, severe restrictions. Okay, um, and Neil Ferguson, uh, well-known uh, historian from uh, was previously at Oxford uh, has gone around uh, really telling what is tantamount to lies about uh, about Chinese uh, uh, what what has what what the Chinese did uh, during this period and and there's a old debate between him and Daniel Bell, a Canadian uh, professor of political philosophy, uh, uh, where Daniel Bell basically shows that. Uh, Neil Ferguson uh, was was very careful, was economical with the truth to speak, uh, you know, to use the language of his hero, his hero, uh, Mr. Thatcher. But coming back to to, to uh, Wuhan, um, by the time they realized how serious the problem was, and because of the exponential nature of the spread of the virus and in infections, it was deemed necessary to have uh, what we call stay in shelter lockdowns. And people were restricted not only in Wuhan city, but also in the uh, three provinces around Wuhan, including Hubei province, which is where Wuhan is. Uh, the reason to, to emphasize this is because uh, people often say, why three provinces and not just Hubei? It's because of the location of Wuhan being on the river. Um, it, a lot of workers commute on a daily basis to, to Wuhan city to work and uh, uh, Wuhan city and its environs to work. And so there's tremendous commuting of almost 5 million people every day. Uh, and so it is important for us to put that into perspective. So uh, Neil Ferguson, for example, uses the figure of 5 million, uh, omitting to mention that this is normal commuting traffic. Uh, he gives the impression that these 5 million people were traveling all over the world spreading the virus uh, to, to people all over the world. But anyway, coming back to this, it, in, in China, it is customary for holidays, uh, for ma two major holidays to take place. One uh, is around the time of the Chinese New Year, where many people make uh, uh, sort of a, almost a pilgrimage back to see their, 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 their usually to their hometowns, their home villages. And the second major holiday is usually during the month of October and when people do some traveling to take advantage of the fall uh, atmosphere and so on and so forth. So um, China then, after workers were, had, were going back to their villages and towns and so on and so forth, they were then urged to stay wherever they were for, uh, for an additional, for an additional uh, two week, an additional week. So there was a two week period uh, where, but only the people in Wuhan and the immediate environs were subjected to this stay in shelter lockdown. What the reason for emphasizing all this is that stay in shelter lockdowns were not imposed in the rest of China, 
which is um, well over 20 other pro prov major provinces in China. And they were not imposed in all the other East Asian countries where we have seen um, two things. One, uh, we have seen the, the contagion being contained. And secondly, we have seen uh, some economic growth, not the economic growth which we saw in 2019, for instance, but for example, the, the economies which have been growing up largely from East Asia. We're talking about Korea, we're talking about, about China itself, we're talking about uh, uh, Vietnam and so on. So all this is important for us to bear in mind uh, because uh, uh, some of you may know that uh, Angus Deaton, the, the uh, Nobel laureate from, from Scotland and, and Princeton, uh, he, he, he came out with a paper last week, I think, uh, where he, he basically um, makes this argument more generally uh, uh, about, about uh, the relative performance of economies and so on. So he's basically saying that not only lives have been lost, but livelihoods have also been lost uh, in countries which did not take uh, strict precautionary uh, measures. So what happened in the rest of East Asia is very important. What, what we saw a great deal of was a great deal of testing. Now, it's important for people to know that uh, although uh, the tests which are done in the West are largely uh, what are called PCR tests, these tests are usually quite expensive for developing countries. And so there are cheaper tests, which are antigen tests, uh, less accurate, one has to emphasize, uh, uh, less accurate, but they are, because they are so much cheaper about 5% of the, of the PCR test. And I should emphasize that prices have come down a little bit uh, over time, um, that this, this antigen tests are, are relatively cheaper and it has been, um, um, and it is possible to have uh, not only uh, to, to test many more people and also to test people more frequently. Because just because you're, you're not uh, positive uh, today does not mean that you're not you're going to uh, be COVID negative forever, you know. So there is a need for regular testing, especially for people who are uh, highly exposed, people who are involved in frontline work, for instance, and so on. So this is very important to recognize. And the other thing which I think is important to emphasize is that the East Asian economies generally had uh, what you might uh, emphasize, uh, say is an all of government approach and a whole of society approach. And this, I think, is, 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 is important to recognize because in all too many governments, including unfortunately in my own country, uh, governments have seen this essentially as a public health problem and sometimes as a policing problem. In India, for example, many of you have seen images of, of uh, pe people who are, who are losing their, their jobs uh, beginning to walk back to their home villages and getting beaten by the police uh, if they were not if they were still on the roads and so on and so forth and all this happened because they were given basically about four hours notice so the, the situation there is, is is was probably worse than the situation here but here too unfortunately we have seen an approach which has emphasized health and home affairs health and police and and there's been very little else. If you look at, for example, uh, Korea, which was the second most, uh, where, where, the, where the virus had spread most, uh, in the case of Korea, you see tremendous uh, engagement of reorganization of public transportation and so on and so forth. So work, work schedules were staggered. So you don't have the usual morning rush and the evening rush. You, you, you know, people had to come in to work at different times. Public transport was reorganized. Uh, to, to ensure that, you, that, that people were practicing uh, physical distancing. The emphasis was on physical distancing uh, in Asia um, rather than social distancing. Social distancing has a, connotation, has a lot of, of sociological in, uh, connotations, cultural connotations, which obviously were not good, but also um, so, social distancing, basically the consequence of social distancing has led to a whole range of of uh, behavioral and, and psychological issues, uh, which um, uh, Angus Deaton's wife, for example, has given a great deal of attention to. Her name is Anne Case, uh, also a professor at Princeton, and she has done excellent work uh, showing how 
um, you know, uh, uh, mental health problems in, in the United States have greatly increased during the period of high globalization as people experience uh, either job losses or more frequently than job losses was a deterioration in the real conditions of living and an increase of, of household indebtedness and so on and so forth. So you, you basically see an all of government approach being very much emphasized in, in East Asian countries. And I would dare say that in most of the East Asian countries which have successfully contained the crisis, also a whole of society approach. In other words, people in society were reminded almost every day of how pro progress was being made. They were kept, constantly kept educated and informed about what the issues at stake were, why the government's, government was doing certain things, and so on and so forth. There was very, very detailed explanation. And rather than have a stay in shelter lockdown, which is rather, a, a, the Americans would say, a ham-fisted approach, a very broad and crude kind of an approach, you had a much, much more uh, uh, delicate, much more nuanced uh, and targeted uh, approach. For example, in, in Vietnam never had a stay in shelter lockdown. And until November last year, they didn't have a single death uh, when there was a British uh, pilot who had been infected uh, and he was, he was considered to be in a very bad state. There were people who were even willing to donate one lung to make, make sure that not a single person had, it had died in Vietnam from COVID-19. This, this was the, 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 the level of of involvement and voluntarism which you find uh, in, in, uh, in, in Vietnamese society, um, you know, at least until, until November last year. Now, since then, there have been, unfortunately, some deaths and so on and so forth. But I, I mentioned Vietnam because when there was infection, there was evidence of a cluster in what is called a commune in Vietnam. Uh, that commune was isolated. It was basically put under quarantine uh, and um, a tremendous support was given to that particular community uh, with everybody being tested and, uh, and if necessary, isolated and quarantined and also treated, of course. So this, these elements, I think, are extremely important and part of the reason why Asia has been, East Asia particularly, has done relatively well. Not all in countries in East Asia, in the situation in Indonesia, the situation in, in the Philippines is not terribly good. And, uh, um, and uh, even Kerala a province in India has done relatively much better. And it's very, very interesting to see uh, how uh, social, uh, uh, social welfare measures have been introduced and the different types of innovation which have taken place in terms of delivery of, of uh, various things uh, to the communities. Um, so there's a real, there's a tangible sense in which people see that the authorities are concerned about them, trying to help them to weather the, 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 the crisis and, and so on. Now, let me uh, uh, go very, very quickly to, uh, to another issue which might be of interest uh, to, to, to this particular community. And that is the issue of uh, uh, migrant workers. In many countries, uh, especially in Asian countries, including Asian countries, um, foreign migrant workers tend to be very badly treated. And, uh, and, and, and very many of them are usually uh, on their own. They're single, they're bachelors. Many of them are men, most of them are men. And they live in very cramped conditions, trying to earn as much as they can, to save as much as they can and to send home as much as they can. Um, and they, their presence has, 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 has basically uh, often uh, depressed uh, not only wages, but also working conditions in many Asian countries. So they are the object of, a, they, they have become the object of a very mixed in, uh, sentiments by different sections of the population. Uh, and you can, you can guess what, what the sentiments are like. Uh, there's resentment by some and appreciation by others and so on and so forth. So what you, we find is that Singapore, which is a relative, is a developed country, is among the top the 10 richest countries in the world. But in Singapore, um, they managed to get the, to contain the, the contagion during uh, the so-called first wave uh, from around March and April. 
But around June, there was a so-called second wave. And during that second wave, uh, they were not able to contain the situation uh, very well. And, the, and they soon quick, they quickly discovered that, the, the, that much of it was being uh, was, was happening among migrant workers because they had really ignored migrant workers and, uh, and because of the conditions in which migrant workers live and sometimes they work, um, they, were, they were basically, um, they were, the, the pandemic had spread uh, much, much more rapidly among them. Because they were generally young men, um, there, were, there were relatively few deaths, but that didn't, just because you don't die doesn't mean you're not infectious. And so and the, the people they were coming in contact with, for example, people in old age homes and so on and so forth, people doing what are called 3D jobs, dirty, dangerous and depressed jobs, they were the ones who were, who were, who were conveying this. Now, let me um, emphasize that as we know, uh, many the, the, the situation has changed since then. Uh, the, the, everybody tends to follow to varying degrees what's happening in all over the world. And I want to emphasize one other element which has been important for some East Asian countries, and that is the strength of public health systems and particularly universal health care. There's a good paper in the Lancet, I think a few uh, months ago, uh, which basically describes what, why uh, Thailand has done relatively well. And it's mainly due to, apparently if the article is correct, uh, mainly due to steady increase in public health spending. So the levels of inequality in Thailand are nothing much to shout about. They are actually bad and arguably, I have argued in the past, at least uh, when I studied this in the, in the 20th century, uh, the inequality was probably growing faster in Thailand than in any other country in Southeast Asia. Uh, but despite that, they were you. They were they, 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 There was enough of a fiscal, uh, mean, enough fiscal means, and the governments, particularly the last, the last elected government uh, uh, associated with Taksin, who's in exile, perhaps in, in the UK, um, he, he introduced uh, and in, and made a major commitment to improving public health. And although he was deposed around two thousand six. Um, he, he, uh, that, that legacy continues and the governments have continued to improve uh, public health system. So that is certainly another major determinant and, and perhaps part of the reason why the UK is doing relatively better uh, than say the US uh, in, in some respects because of, of the remaining strength of the NHS uh, as, as, as weak as, and debilitated as it has become. Now, let me, uh, without going into detail, too many details about the recent uh, situation, let me quickly move to a, one, final, uh, one final set of issues. Uh, with the advent of the vaccine, and I know not many people, Trump, Donald Trump doesn't have many admirers around the, the world these days, and I don't expect there to be many in SOAS, uh, but I think it's very important to, to acknowledge that Operation Warp Speed certainly accelerated vaccine development in the, in the US and pushed the Europeans to do likewise. So whether we're talking about Moderna's uh, vaccine or even the, 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 uh, the Pfizer vaccine, which is essentially European developed, uh, there has been a tremendous uh, development precisely because of this kind of public spending commitment. But precisely because of that, precisely because of this view that only the private sector can solve these problems, I think we have very, very serious problems. When Jonas Salk uh, developed the polio vaccine over 60 years ago, uh, he was asked uh, why he hadn't taken a patent for it. He said, this is a people's vaccine. And he said, trying to patent the vaccine it's like trying to patent the sun, you know, you, 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 you don't do that. But, you know, um, the health ethos, medical ethos have changed, uh, particularly in the last 40 years or so of, you know, the ascendance of neoliberal thinking, the presumption that only private greed can motivate people to do certain things and so on and so forth. So what we have now is a very, very unfortunate situation 
where this mentality prevails very strongly. And uh, there has been a, a, a proposal uh, to have a waiver on TRIPS provision. TRIPS is the Trade-Related uh, trade Intellectual Property Rights Agreement, which is part of the WTO. Okay, it wasn't, uh, it was only uh, uh, legislated in 1994, and many countries did not uh, actually uh, bring in the, the national le level le uh, uh, legislation until about 10 years later. So it was only in 2005, for example, uh, under Manmohan Singh, if I'm not mistaken, that India had its legislation. And uh, who benefited? I don't think even, even, the, even pharmaceutical companies benefited that much, but it basically deprived many African countries of benefiting from the, from the, from the availability of cheap Indian generic medicines. You know, so you, you can see a lot of people uh, losing out. So what has happened now uh, is a very, very unfortunate situation where governments uh, of the world, of the, of, of the rich world, basically the, the Western world, uh, not the US, uh, at least the Trump administration and uh, the EU and EU governments uh, with, with no exceptions that I, can, I know of and very strange allies such as the uh, Bolsonaro government in Brazil have basically opposed uh, the waiver proposed by South Africa and India. Now, the reason for mentioning this is because, um, you know, when after the new dispensation in South Africa, Mandela became president in 1994, 1996, uh, uh, South Africa hosted the UNCTAD uh, meeting, and this led to a number of changes, which eventually led to um, uh, an amendment to the TRIPS agreement. And this is called the public health exception, which allows for compulsory licensing and a number of other measures. Unfortunately, by and large, it has been very, very difficult for most developing countries to actually exercise uh, their rights under this exception. Um, and the, the company, company lawyers are very, very good at gaming the system. I, I, it's very important to mention this because uh, what we find now is a very unfortunate situation in the world that although on paper the means are there uh, uh, to, to circumvent these problems, in effect, most developing countries are not able to do so. It is only some exceptional countries, uh, India, Bangladesh, um, and uh, South Africa, and a, a handful of other countries, including my own country, who have been able to, to use compulsory licensing and other uh, measures uh, to advantage. Uh, let me give you a, I describe an ironic situation. When avian flu happened uh, some years ago, avian flu, um, uh, the U United States government under George W. Bush at that time uh, gave four companies um, the, the right, the, the compulsory licenses to build, uh, to, to make uh, Tammy flu, the only known virus flu uh, uh, vaccine at that time. Tam Tammy flu was the was uh, uh, it's a Swiss uh, thing, but the Swiss company uh, did not agree, and basically the U.S. government, under exercising the trips uh, their trips right trips exceptional right, exception rights, uh, basically uh, asked those companies to, to to produce it. Ironically, of course. Uh, birds can't fly across either Pacific or, or Atlantic Ocean. So even flu never reached the US. So there were 3 million doses of Tamiflu in the US, which were not used. And the rest of the world uh, was only able to buy Tamiflu at, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, what is, um, at the regular prices. Uh, no other country, no other country was able to, to, to use compulsory licensing to manufacture Tamiflu, Temi not because, for technical reasons, but because simply for, the, for legal reasons. So what we have now is a situation, a very, very unfortunate situation, where the WHO came up, came, wanted to do something called an, and, uh, an existing uh, sort of 
uh, coalition called GAVI, the Vaccine Alliance, um, uh, and another organization called CEPI. They came up with the idea which had worked in the past for so-called neglected tropical diseases. The idea was that for neglected tropical diseases, the victims are mainly poor and not able to pay. So the idea then was that you, by pre-ordering in, in, in significant quantities and subsidizing the development of the vaccine, you basically could get the private sector to do something in the, in the public interest. Okay, and th this was basically the, and so this involves something called the AMC, Advanced Market Commitment. And it works quite well. But for uh, COVID-19, this, this approach basically has failed completely. So you have a very ironic situation where a country like Canada has ordered five times its it's the requirements of its own population. Um, European countries have done the same, and they're quite happy to, to not only to, to pay for it, they can afford it, but basically this has meant that other countries have be basically been deprived. So recently, some of you may know that there has been a conflict between uh, Ursula von Leyen, the uh, president of the European Commission, who has been in a big quarrel with the uh, with the UK, I think, and, and with, uh, with Ireland, because she tried to close the border between Ireland and Northern Ireland, uh, ostensibly because she did not want the vaccines to cross over, uh, which is ironic, of course, because the UK has much more uh, vaccines available to it for various reasons uh, compared to Ireland. But in any case, this happened, and, uh, it, it's, and she may well lose her job. Uh, she may well for, be forced to resign. But the more fundamental issue really is that this whole state of affairs has basically meant that many people in developing countries will not be able to access. It's not because they can't manufacture it. India has an organization called the Serum Institute of India, which has the largest manufacturing capacity, capacity in the world. It is capable of producing hundreds of millions of vaccines within a fairly short period of time. But it cannot do so without the necessary information and so on and so forth. So we have a situation where the technical possibility is there. There's no limitation on the technical side, but because of the legal situation and because of the intransigence of the VEX, of the companies and the basic defense of the principle of intellectual property, we have a situation where many, I, 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 I say this without exaggeration, where you basically have intellectual property causing genocide. Okay, there are going to be lots of people and, and who are going to be infected and some are going to die unnecessarily. It's going to be a major disruption to lives as well as livelihoods. And, uh, and uh, needless to say, it is going to slow down the world economy. Unfortunately, the law, this is all considered perfectly legal. And uh, despite the willingness of many governments to break laws, including international laws on other matters, there, is not, there isn't a coalition of the willing to do something about this. So this is the kind of unfortunate situation we have in ourselves at the present moment. So I, I just want to conclude with that and, and then uh, perhaps we can have a bit of a discussion uh, and, and uh, I hope I hope this has been clear enough. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jomo. This was such a wide-ranging, uh, you know, talk with so much uh, for us to think about. Uh, it was remiss of me also to not thank you for accepting uh, our invitation, given that it's quite late at night for you over there. Uh, so that you know, thanks again for that. A couple of questions have already come out in the chat. We have. Jules, who says, why do you think that most of the world did not follow the example of early COVID response in East Asia? And we have Alicia Farouk, who says, do you think COVID-19 has brought serious impact to the development of national security frameworks, particularly cyber surveillance? Um, I'm not really in an authoritative position to speak on either issue. 
I don't know enough about how governments make their minds, but I think it, is, it would not be an exaggeration to say that much of the world still looks to the West for leadership, including intellectual leadership, including policy leadership. And um, as you, some of you may remember, or most of you might remember, uh, Boris Johnson uh, was going for herd immunity until I think the 17th of March uh, last year, which is when around the time the ICL study came out, Imperial College of London study came out and basically suggested that that strategy uh, might well result in about 2% of the population of the UK dying. Uh, much higher than what was previously assumed by the Johnson government. Uh, and then we have a very unfortunate situation that, for example, many of us in the com British Commonwealth, uh, despite uh, Britain isolating itself from the Commonwealth over the last three or four decades, um, we find a, a very unfortunate situation where, um, where unfortunately, uh, not many um, many, many governments tend to still look west for, for policy guidance, for intellectual guidance, for, and, and so on. So, uh, you know, for example, when the Russians first announced a Sputnik 2, uh, the, 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 the virus, everybody poo pooed it. And I, I'll be very interested to see what happens uh, uh, in response to the, uh, to La the Lancet publishing this, uh, these findings uh, today, because these findings are re really uh, incredible. It's 51% uh, um, compared to, to, um, to 99, slightly lower, just slightly lower for the Pfizer uh, vaccine, but the Pfizer vaccine is stage two trials, which are, and the implications are different, the sampling size is different, and so on and so forth. So having this kinds of results at the stage three level is uh, very, very impressive. Um, Chinese numbers are not terribly impressive at this point. Um, who knows when the, when, you know, because there's still, this, this whole question of vaccine development is proceeding very, very fast. And it's very unfortunate that um, uh, the EC president uh, is complaining about uh, Oxford AstraZeneca because, you know, uh, Oxford AstraZeneca has, has uh, delayed the, the release of, of uh, some of the vaccines because they, they were learning. I mean, one should remember that vaccine development normally takes years and all this has been done in less than a year. And so, you know, allowing some time to correct uh, if that is truly what happened in the case of, of Oxford AstraZeneca is something which is to be appreciated rather than to be denigrated, which unfortunately has been the case. So I, I'm, I'm guessing here, I don't have an authoritative answer to the first question. Uh, on the second question, um, uh, second question was about... Uh, um, it's like, it's forms of surveillance, national security frameworks, yes. particularly cyber surveillance, yes. Yes, well, I, I think the cyber surveillance issue I'm not sure what the question has in mind. Um, cyber surveillance has been going on for, for, for quite some time. It's not clear to me that there has been a significant increase in cyber surveillance because of COVID-19. Uh, the fact that most, pe most people are staying at home and all that kind of thing, uh, uh, and, and uh, you know, uh, will probably mean that they're in less public spaces and that there might be less surveillance as a consequence. Um, but I, I, have, I really have no way of answering that question in any serious empirical fashion. I suppose, you know, I mean, that goes back to one of our previous webinars, which we had with a scholar of uh, the internet and of internet practices, uh, Paolo Gerbaudo, who teaches at King's College here. And uh, we ended up talking a little bit about the idea of a vaccine passport, where I think now airlines and so forth are asking, they've at least decided, the IATA has decided or its constituents have decided that when international travel becomes more unrestricted, uh, they would like to ask passengers for a so-called vaccine passport, that they would like to see uh, you know, some kind of, you know, on an app on their phone that they have in fact been vaccinated and that that itself would 
uh, you know, be a form of surveillance. But perhaps Alicia could reframe her question and come back. Meanwhile, we can take uh, Diedrich, uh, Brendan Diedrich. Do you think the lack of a national identity in the US contributed to the poor federal state government and individual responses? And perhaps we could make that into a broader question because we see, for example, as you mentioned, the Indian case, uh, one part of the Indian response was a hyper-nationalist and in fact a Hindu majoritarian identity formation under Mr. Modi. Uh, we don't know because we, you know, at least in my case, I'm not sure about the data that they release, but uh, certainly that was very much a part of their, um, you know, sort of uh, response to create a very strong sense of national or Hindu identity. Is that something that you see in, in any of the East Asian contexts? I think um, in some instances, I'm not sure, I think in the West, in the US, in the UK, perhaps in some parts of Europe, and certainly in Australia, there was initially uh, quite a bit of anti-Asian mm. uh, sentiment. Um, and many of the Asians involved were, in, were wearing masks and they were actually subject to a, a lot of, uh, of um, um, yeah, so, social vilification. Mm. Uh, I have a Japanese colleague uh, at MIT uh, and he was telling me about getting on to the to public transport and as soon as he got on to the transport um, and he moved to a particular part of the of the carriage, uh, people moved away from him. Okay? And this is an MIT professor. Okay? And this this is the, 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 his his stop is the MIT stop. Okay, so it's not exactly you know. Uh, uh, in fact, his stop is about uh, as he said two blocks away from from Moderna's headquarters. All oh, right. Okay. So um, so I'm sure that has part of it, but. I think I think uh, having a not um, identity politics has been around for for quite some time, and I don't think uh, there's any less identity politics. Well, certainly there is less identity politics in East Asia, uh, in any of these societies. But if you take Kerala, for example. Kerala has got, uh, you know, perhaps a Hindu majority, but barely, yeah. because uh, Malabar is, is, is quite Muslim. And then you also have significant Christian minorities. Yes. Uh, and, and, uh, and, but the, the, the and, and of course, uh, Kerala is, is unique, perhaps, uh, because it has so many migrant workers yeah. who were expelled from the Middle East when the price of oil came down and so on about two years ago, and they had come back and very many of them were living off their savings and so on. Then you have a second expulsion when, when, when the lockdown was announced uh, in India. So many of them uh, moved from wherever they were, often Delhi uh, or Bombay, or Mumbai, down uh, back to Kerala. Mm. And, and uh, so, you know, so these, although these are Malayalis, Keralites, they were they were in some sense alien, you know. They were coming back, uh, but you know, and and there was a lot of suspicion. And don't forget that Kerala was the first place uh, where uh, uh, somebody who was was discovered as being uh, uh, COVID nineteen positive, and that was a student who had come back from Wuhan. So a lot of uh, uh, Kerala uh, Keralaite students in Wuhan studying in the engineering schools in Wuhan. So, and it was one of them who, who brought it uh, back to, to, to Kerala and, and to India, okay? uh, without necessarily meaning to do so, but this, this certainly happened in January itself. So, I, it's very difficult, uh, you know, because, I, I, you know, because uh, identity politics um, is significant, it has grown a lot, in, but it means different things in many different societies, you know. Um, um, uh, Hindutva um, chauvinism in, in India has very different implications from, say, uh, you know, uh, uh, white Christian, um, you know, chauvinism in 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 the, in the U.S. Uh, and in turn, it has a, 
different implications from what Bolsonaro does in, in, in uh, Brazil and so on. So I'm, I'm a little hesitant. Uh, there might be something to what is being said. Uh, it is often said. I've heard two, two things. Whenever I make this argument about East Asia, I, hear, I often hear two things. One is that, uh, oh, these are uh, homogeneous societies. Uh, Japan is homogeneous. Uh, uh, Korea is homogeneous and, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, the other thing I often hear is that, oh, oh you cannot generalize from them. They are all run by communists. <laughs> So, yeah. you know, I mean, you can't, so I say, well, you know, what, what Korea is not, is no. suddenly not run, run by a communist party. Uh, well, then they say, yeah, 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 they run communist like because of influence of North Korea. So people can, can twist and turn the arguments anyway. Just having an authoritarian government is not much, uh, um, it's not much protection, doesn't offer much protection. So I, I would not, I, again, I'm sorry, I really cannot answer that question very well. Actually, can I just, uh, you know, there's a variation on that, uh, especially the Korea, you know, argument, which I heard from a Korean colleague who left SOAS and is now teaching in Seoul. And his point was that because of military conscription, uh, there is a feeling of rule compliance and the idea that, you know, whole of society, all of the state and everyone is responsible. So the argument was not so much based on the communism or on the cultural homogeneity, but was based on rule compliance that comes from uh, military conscription. But, you know, I don't know if there is enough of a sample of countries that where one could make that kind of an argument general. I also was very interested in what you said about Kerala, because there's a third level of migrant issues there, which is that a lot of migrant workers from the rest of India, especially my, my state Bihar, now work in Kerala in plantations and so on. And one of the things that the Kerala government did in contrast with many other states or the national level was that it stopped them from going. It provided them with food and it provided them with medication as well as income. So for example, many of the people who were returnees of the Gulf uh, took this as something, and who were many of them were Muslims, took this as part of their charity functions as good Muslims. And we have all kinds of stories of people who were owners of plantations who had come, who had bought the plantation after coming back, uh, you know, in subsequent waves of returns of migrants from the Gulf, and saw this as a, as a good deed that they were doing. So both at the level of the state, uh, in terms of the provision of proper shelter, proper medication, housing, money in hand. The Kerala government also recharged their mobile phones so that they could communicate with their families back in the villages that they came from. Uh, then of course, they used quite a lot of the uh, institutions that the Kerala government has made of, over the last 20 years, uh, you know, for uh, other kind of distribution of social services. They basically were able to marshal that in that so yeah, uh, interesting that uh, you know that's that Kerala comes in, and of course it is such a such a good example from that point of view. Uh, I think there's one question here from Sasha Gill who says, "How does one understand community solidarity in response to COVID-19 in Vietnam? Is it just a cultural thing, or is there another way to understand that as well?" Well, the strongest instances of uh, of solidarity. In relation to the to the to this crisis is really um, is partly Kerala. Okay. The kind of solidarity I you, you thank you very much for for reminding me of the third migrant element. Mm. And all this, by the way, for you know for 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 everybody to remember, is a situation where Kerala probably has the most difficult fiscal problem mm. because there's no fiscal base mm. besides agriculture to to speak of. Mm. And you, 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 it's it's extremely difficult. So you have very modest fiscal means uh, because of the nature of of, of the Kerala economy, uh, and you cannot tax uh, immigrants. If, uh, my, sorry, my, migrant workers who, who have gone and earned their money elsewhere, and so it becomes extremely difficult. Uh, so it's particularly challenging. I think what uh, the the point you you, you raise actually is a very important reminder. But um, Social sol in the case of Kerala, it has been articulated in, in various different ways, which are actually quite well known in the West because there has been some coverage. What is less well known, perhaps, is the way it has been articulated in places like, like Vietnam or, 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 or Laos, 
you know. But again, you have so-called communist parties uh, uh, ruling there. But in the case of of uh, of um, Korea, uh, I part of the reason I became very active very early on the on the on COVID nineteen was because I stopped there for thirty six hours uh, on the fourth of February, and uh, I I I was looking for masks for for my father-in-law who needed masks because of a volcano eruption in the Philippines. Okay, not, not nothing to do with COVID-19. And I couldn't find masks because all the masks in the Philippines had been, had been sold out because of the volcano eruption. And there was a lot of ash uh, because it was a very major eruption. So I, I then um, uh, came back here uh, on a Wednesday, and a Friday morning, I got a call from a ho the, ho the hotel I stayed in for only one night, telling me that although I had checked in on Tuesday, somebody had left the hotel on Sunday and had later been tested and, and had been tested COVID positive. Okay, so you can see what is going on here. Okay, you have he's tested confirm positive, everybody in the hotel, even those who have gone back to their own countries is informed about, you know, that they might have been exposed. And then I was even given some advice on things I could, I could do. It is that kind of, of thing which, which, which made me aware, high, underlined for me how, 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 how uh, uh, you know, how much uh, what what is called contact tracing uh, what was going on, uh, and I contrast that to what ha ha has happened here in Malaysia. Uh, there was a major religious gathering, in fact, a major religious gathering, but it was it was sort of clandestine. Was responsible for the a major cluster in Daegu uh, city in in Korea, but in Malaysia there was a major religious gathering of public. You probably know this. Uh, so the, uh, the public group, they meant, and that group, that gathering uh, spread uh, COVID-19 to India, Bangladesh, um, and, and about five other countries in this part of the world. Um, so, but of the, of, of the 18,000 who attended that, 16,000 were Malaysians. Okay? And, and as of my last checking, which was about two months later, almost 5,000 had not even been traced. Okay? I mean, that, you know, so you don't even know what the police are doing. Okay? You should be, you know, all the detective, uh, the detection capacities of the police should be used for things like this instead of catching people on the street and, you know, uh, beating them up, and you know they don't e often they don't even quite know they don't quite understand why they're being uh, forced to stay at home and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So you you know so it's a it's a constant education is actually quite important. Now I you know I I, I was involved as you mentioned uh, in 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 uh, in the FAO, and I did quite a bit in terms of trying to promote the idea of of public health education, particularly nutrition education, using the media, using the public, the, 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 the commercial media, uh, you know. So, so for example, in, in the US, the for, former dean of public health at the UCLA School of Public Health actually is also an advisor uh, to two very popular programs. One is called Grace Anatomy, which some of you have watched. Hmm. And it's been running for about two decades. You mean the TV show Grey's Anatomy? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. And, but, you know, they insert all kinds of public health messages uh, in the program. And the other one, of course, which is also quite popular, I'm not sure whether it's reached the UK, it's called uh, uh, Law and Order SVU. That's right, yeah. yeah. Which is about often to do with sexuality and, and sexual yeah. relations and so on and so forth. So, you know, Public health messages are being conveyed all the time. 
by, by having this kind of ad advisory thing. And it's very easy to do that with other things, you know? And, and uh, I, I've, but of all the people I was talking to um, during the uh, major conference, which I was involved in organizing, uh, the main interest came from very strange, from places like Korea, which produces a lot of soap operas, which mm. sell a lot. Um, nothing from India, mm. this Bollywood, uh, nothing from Hong Kong or anything like that. Um, nothing from, from Brazil, uh, from Mexico, Colombia, which produces a lot of soap operas. That's good. Yeah. Hispanic world. Um, and, but interest from the Vatican. <laughs> yeah. uh, but that's partly because yeah. I invited the Pope to open the conference. You know? yeah. <laughs> I see. Um, there are, you know, I don't want to, uh, you know, hold you for too long because I know it's very late for you. Uh, but I but just it's very late to... for you guys too. Right? Uh, well, actually, no, it's only five, uh, quarter past five almost here. Yeah. Um, but I wanted to sort of, you know, you mentioned Africa very briefly. And of course, you know, we, I think initially there was a lot of fear for Nigeria, uh, for Ghana and so on, but they did okay. And in fact, for a while, uh, the Ghanaians actually, you know, the head of their public uh, health uh, service, I think, uh, also produced many videos for YouTube and so forth. And in fact, his major argument, it seems to me, the Ghanaian, the Senegalese and the Nigerians, was that they had been through regional pandemics before. And that uh, that experience of having to deal with those kinds of things uh, produced a degree of readiness and also some degree of self-reliance because they had seen that it was not easy for them to go to the international community and to you know rely on the, on on their resources so do you have any thoughts on that How, you know countries that were expected to do much worse but came out doing much better than people for, than people feared right i'll i'll, I'll try to answer this with a couple of quick anecdotes. Yeah. Um, you know, when the, when the testing of, of the new vaccines took place, the, when, when the vaccines were, were yeah. being used, um, quite a number of people in Norway, okay? But they were all over 85 years old, mm. okay? So obviously, although people say the virus doesn't discriminate, it discriminates in terms of, of its effects. Yeah. And, uh, um, you know, half the people who are infected show no symptoms. Either they're pre-symptomatic or they have no symptoms whatsoever. Mm. And it's really younger people. Mm. So what has happened and what, I, what I'm being told, and, you know, the Indian figures are not that bad either. Mm, exactly, yeah. And part of the reason I'm being told, I, I, I have not read the literature enough, but... What I'm, I'm told is that because life expectancy is much shorter in countries like India and many African countries and so on, the impact is much smaller. So the, it, it is only in, in, in societies where, where life expectancy is much higher and where, do you, you, you understand the term HAIL? Yeah. Uh, a healthy, a healthy life expectancy. Yeah. So health, Healthy life expectancy is actually almost as high as life expectancy. Then, then, there, there, uh, you you you're more likely to see an impact. So, the, so some uh, society like Korea, where people are uh, sorry, or, or Japan or China, where people longevity is quite high, uh, there you expect a, a greater impact. Whereas uh, people in India, whose life expectancies, I'm not sure whether. You have even reached seventy. Yeah, yeah some yeah, uh, upper sixties kind of thing. Yes. Yeah. And they have a much no. younger population, sixty odd percent, etc. So exactly, yeah. mm. and African populations are even younger. Mm. So, so I am told that that is part of the reason. Um, but even among African populations, um, Senegal is doing much better than some of the other countries. And again, I'm not quite sure why. Uh, uh, a former colleague of mine has is, is, is been quite involved in the Senegalese response, but I don't have a clear idea why, but everybody has their favorite explanation. Mm -hmm. The Being generally skeptical about everything, yes. so I, 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 I 
I don't want to repeat just, uh, one particular view just because it happens to be from a friend. Sure. Yeah. I, I think we have to be much more rigorous in looking at the evidence. But I suspect age has got something to do with it. Yes. Uh, uh, let's take the final round of uh, you know questions. Hopefully, sorry, sorry, people... sorry. The other the other yeah. point I was going to make is that it is the countries which are most isolated, particularly from air travel. Mm. You know how many people go to Chad or Niger? Mm. Okay, and the numbers are very low there. Mm. So, so you know if if you if there's not many people moving in and out, it's very unlikely that yeah. people will be infected. Or, and the other pop thing, of course, is the Donald Trump's uh, standard answer. Yeah. If you don't test, you won't know. Same for India initially as well. And as it turns out, there are parts of India where people have not heard of COVID and therefore have not suffered from COVID because they're in the very remote mountains of in the deep forests. Mm -hmm. um, final three questions. One of them is actually on Malaysia. Uh, do you think the current, and this is uh, Alicia Farooq coming back. Do you think the current protocol employed by the Malaysian government is the most effective way to go about it with the current MCO, which I don't know the full form of, but I'm sure you do. Um, the sim very short, simple answer to it is I'm, I'm, I've been uh, 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 quite critical of this. I, as I mentioned earlier, the stay in shelter lockdown or what is called the MCO in Malaysia, movement control order, uh, yeah. is a very blunt instrument uh, and imposing it at the national level, partly to, part, we have a very complicated situation in Malaysia because there's a government with a razor thin majority yeah. and parliament was suspended. The first uh, movement control order did not involve any suspension of parliament. Only uh, last month uh, was parliament suspended, ostensibly for public health reasons. And, and so, uh, you know, so the whole situation and understanding of many of these uh, issues are, are, is complicated. A group of 46, uh, 44 of whom were medical practitioners and the president of the nurses union, plus myself, we uh, signed a petition uh, a letter to the Prime Minister about a month ago, basically uh, uh, arguing that we that there are a variety of issues which need to be improved um, uh, in, in Malaysia, and we really do not agree with having uh, a stay in shelter lockdown. Um, as I have argued throughout uh, this, uh, what, what uh, I think we need to take far more precautionary measures, uh, but the, the the movement control order is a very blunt instrument. Uh, I think you did address a part of uh, Nikhil's question, uh, and which, which is about, do you sort of favor nationalized pharma industry? Or in fact, would you, in, in my view, would you think that there should be a global sort of, you know, especially for things which are so lethal as this one, should there be some kind of global protocol or, you know, for, free you know distribution of uh, goods because of uh, of uh, vaccines as public goods in line of what you said earlier in fact in your in your piece today in in the ips uh, site which i saw on vaccine nationalism what what is the kind of level at which you would like to see institutional change take place well i think you you know what i argued there and i, yes. I will, and we, we will be arguing in a series of other articles and have argued in the past about this. Uh, I have, uh, for example, written about this in connection with other issues. Uh, Arjun Jayadev at the uh, Premji University has also written very usefully on this. And I don't know whether you've seen this recent piece by Acharya and Reddy no, uh, not yet, no. on, on, on this. It's, it's quite a useful, short and useful piece uh, in a very unlikely place, the Barron's magazine. Okay. But, but uh, uh, um, basically, the big problem now is that we are in a mess. The, the we meaning the whole, that the, the intellectual property has managed to secure a strong foothold. It cannot be dislodged. The power of, of uh, the pharmaceutical companies have been able to mobilize their governments behind them very, very successfully. I mean, if this is not an emergency, you know, requiring that kind of extraordinary measures, I don't know what is, you know. Um, you know, uh, certainly the, the scale of the threat is much greater than, than, than when Mandela successfully pushed for the public health exception. So I, 
I do think that it's it's going to be very difficult to bring bring about change. So, um, but I th I think um, I actually think that tactically, uh, India and um, South Africa should have gone about it differently. Thrown the ball in the other foot. Uh, sorry, throw, throw the ball in the other court mm. by by insisting that the public health exception would have allowed should have allowed this. Mm. And then, rather than asking for a special waiver, okay, because if you read the the letter of the law, the the, the public health exception actually, in my view, uh, I'm no lawyer, um, covers this kind of situation by Asking for a waiver, you basically are asking for an exception to the rules. Right. You, you, you see that it's yes, a exactly, technical yeah. point, you know, and and uh, unfortunately, I think we're now in a very difficult situation. Um, and um, I, I, I think I made this appeal, as you as you know, to uh, to, to the Biden administration. Uh, rejoining the, yes. the WHO is not good enough. Uh, being more positive in the WTO is needed, and one very good signal which would which would gain a lot of support, uh, you know, internationally would be precisely to 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 uh, to support the waiver and to advocate for the waiver. I, I want to compare this with uh, with uh, the Doha round, which unfortunately has gone nowhere. But the Doha round after the WTO ministerial meeting in Seattle. In 1999, yeah. it almost seemed as if the WTO was not going to move after all. And basically, after 9/11, almost all the countries in the world, regardless of political tendencies and so on and so forth, they expressed solidarity with the U.S. Yeah. And that uh, uh, basically moved uh, Bush uh, to push for a round. So. Because most of these countries were developing countries, he he agreed to the idea of a so-called development round. Now you and I know that the development round is worthy of its name, but but the fact was that they, they felt obliged to make a major concession mm. by creating a development round, and this I think is the moment we are in right now. Here's the Biden administration trying to to regain leadership for the U.S on a completely different basis from the previous administration, one of the best, easiest ways to do so is to do is to make a very major concession. I just want to remind you of something else which happened about 30 years ago, oh sorry, about four, uh, 42 years ago, 43 years ago, the Soviet Union challenged the US uh, to, to, to eliminate uh, uh, smallpox in the world. And we can do it in 10 years if we work together. And this was at a WHO meeting. To the surprise of the, of, um, and, and at that time, I think it was Jimmy Carter who was the president of the US. The US took up the challenge, put in the money, uh, and the Soviets, of course, put up, put up uh, money and a few, a few others as well. And uh, within 10 years, we saw the end of smallpox. So it's as if it cannot be done. But I think we really have to seize the moment. And that's why, you know, somebody called me up earlier and said, you know, why are you being so so nice to Mr. Biden, you know, don't know what he is and et cetera, et cetera. I said, yes, but there are special moments. And who would have expected Franklin Delano Roosevelt to have risen to, to, that, to that moment in 1933, you know? And likewise, you know, we expected so much of, of, of uh, Obama with his wonderful rhetoric you know, and uh, it turned out to be a great disappointment. So, I, I, I'm prepared to give him the benefit of the doubt, and and but also keeping my and also uh, having a, a prayer under under my breath. Thank you so much, Jomo, to end on such a, if I can call it, optimistic note, or at least uh, hopeful note, and uh, you know, to have such a wonderful conversation with you, and uh, for you to answer so many questions. Uh, in such a comprehensive and easy to, uh, easy to follow way for all of our listeners. I wish you all the best and I wish you good night. I hope you get a good night's sleep. Uh, what time is it over there? 
it's close to two, uh, 1 30, 1 30. Okay, all right. Okay, we've taken enough of your time and I hope to yeah. uh, at some actually, point... Actually, this, this, this is when I start working, actually. <laughs> it's, 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 this it's is easier when I to, stop working. I stop it's, working it, at it, It's easier to work at night when it's cooler and the daytime is just too hot. Oh, too hot, is it? Okay. All right, <laughs> all the best to you and I, I, I hope that our paths will cross again soon. Okay, okay so good. thank you, bye and bye. Uh, thank you all the rest of you for for your interest and okay. Yes, right. Bye bye. Bye.